my pleasure to introduce to you um, Jackie Bangkong Obi and Nicole Orocho Hernandez. Each of these poets will read for about 15 minutes, and then we will finish this reading with a QA for both the poets. So please feel free to um, mute until we get to that QA time so that we can give our full attention to the poets reading. Um, but you can use the chat to uh, you know, encourage the poets, type lines or phrases that might shine for you. Um, and then when it gets to the QA time, the chat is also a place to drop questions um, as well as you can uh, use your audio. If you need a written copy of Jackie or Nicole's poems for accessibility purposes, you can direct an email to poetsandpajamas at gmail.com. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Jackie Bangkong Obi. Uh, Jackie Bangkong Obi is a poet living and writing from Abuja, Niger Nigeria. Her chapbook, What Steel Yields, was chosen by Kwame Dawes and Chris Abani for publication in the New Generation African Poets box set by Akashic Books and APBF. Jackie is co-editor at Iceflow Press, and her work is forthcoming, and in London Grip, the Kalahari Review, Reliquia Journal, Patchwork Lit Mag, Better Magazine, The Poetry Review, Pigeonholes, and Memento, an anthology of contemporary Nigerian poetry, and more. Jackie is on Twitter as at JackieB5. I'm gonna also drop that bio in the chat so you can read it along. I also just dropped that in the chat. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. All right. And uh, thank you again, Jackie, I'll let you take it away. All right, thank you, SJ. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I think I would like to start by Thank you, you know, poets in pajamas and sundress. And then of course, um, sponsorships, by, you know, by um, Poetry Magazine for having me. I know you had a lot of submissions for this. So I'm really, really honored to be one of the poets chosen to do this. Um, I'll first like to also <laughs> apologize to everyone. I talked up a good game when I said I was gonna bring bonnets and other sundry accessories to this. This was supposed to be like, you know, a pyjama thing, but unfortunately the bonnet didn't make it. So sorry, everybody. <laughs> okay, so I would just like to go right ahead to the poems <laughs> and just read. So I'll start by reading um, False Leads. It was published, um, I think two years ago. So um, False Leads for G after reading Drea Mason, Campbell, and Nazim Hikmet. In the receding light of the day, my eyes are thirsty, the world is fine. You could never get enough of grassy meadows, ribbons of green and lemon, fronding and cheerful. I am at the doorway of the police station, a slow wind rustles through the field of lemongrass. And beyond, there are birds singing the evening. I want to believe I can hear your voice in the fray. Inside, someone undone by grief crows brokenly. All this grieving and the dead stay dead. It's true we are born with the same assurance of death meaning we do not have to go looking for some things to find us. The city is known for its throng of morning doves. To leave the roost is to know the way back. But the real injury is a stray bullet, the indifference of its plunder, a raptor's swoop and stolid violence. A gun shot inside a dove's nest will hardly miss by which I mean, deplume its flight. I could never look into the faces of the dead. On the news screens, the bodies pile and pile. Look at it this way. The point isn't just how, the point isn't just about how hard it is to face the cruelty of loss, but to stay soft, to grow new wings. 
Okay, so I'll just go right ahead to the second poem. This poem was published um, last year by a Kay journal. It's called A Turn in the Ruining, Postscript of Hamatan and Whimsy. Tinapa, a wet dawn we are watching after winds hunt, crying through trees drowned in night rains. Lights overture, split forest of race mosas in brackish waters, the season exacting redress in a prosaic and sullen September. Ordinary time signaling of a turn in the ruinings left, leaf litter to the bulk of another fall. It's not the tree's fault. Hamatan, old novelty, keeps circling back, drawing from the tangents of usual grievances. So the use of us all back, all the mucky froth of yet monsoon streaking piling on until a year's worth of archival scripts refined, scattered to the river mouth, reminding us nothing greens forever. The dark dirigibles underneath it all. These whims of life circles fated to repeat in the silent architectonics of sap and the muted reveries of blood, knotting and unknotting universes of rind into the long genealogies of blooming. There are days when the current is an uncut stream, coming and going, clear with its own meanings. Aqua, translatable. But today, the slag comes rushing in, muddying the water, clogging the flow, and the morning clouds, overcast, fleeting shadows to a familiar place, lend even more shape to the grim opulence straining towards brink. A demand stacked on demand. How the heft is gradually built into things until history's final recourse, proving again and again that despite the shifts, something has lived here before and come will again. Perhaps it has something to do with the shape of water, that primed arc, how easily she refuges whatever plunges beneath the meniscus, exerting life's protracted arrangement with the times. Until the returning moon tides, clearing old creeks, divulging old paths, settling fresh water scrubland, until sap, Boscage of wood and sylvan rises back to crown new wits, to nest new songs of sky. Love, to what then do we hold on to, hung over on the tallies of all our once wished for forevers. So um, just a quick note on this poem. Tinapa is um, a tropical um, resort town in Calabar, a, south, a town in the south, a coastal town in the southeastern, um, uh, southeastern Nigeria. So the last poem I'm going to be reading is called Bungavilia. This one was published in Memento, you know, the contemporary anthology of Nigerian poetry. My fingertips, scented and nectar sweetened fitted in dry season blossoms, tender and spike shorn, split raw with familiar ache, bungavilliard. The blooms, bold and vining, petals skyward pointing as if praying or votive. The way humans yearn for beauty, avid and ravenous like a candle lit and flickering, races to burn itself out. Eager, I pluck at them and leave bits of myself, human sacrifice for the perennial altar, because beauty rarely leaves you unscathed. When she touches you, she splits you open, tender, soft like new birth, a sacred thing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Jackie. Um, next, I'll go ahead and introduce 
Nicole Rocho Hernandez. Nicole was raised in Cabo Rojo, Puerto Rico. Her poems have been published in the Asintos Review, Electric Literature, and elsewhere. She's received awards from the Academy of American Poets and the Swarthout Foundation and a nomination for the Pushcart Prize. She was a finalist for the 2022 Black Warrior Review Poetry Prize, judged by Diane Seuss. Her chapbook, I Have No Ocean, was published by Sundress Publications. Her second chapbook is forthcoming with Glass Poetry Press. Her work has been supported by the Hombidge Center and the Center for Imagination in the Borderlands, among others. She's the translations editor at Hayden's Ferry Review and an MFA candidate at Arizona State. Thank you so much, Nicole. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, thank you for that introduction. And thank you for your poems, Jackie. What a wonderful way to start the night. Um, I have a lot to think about. Your lines are so beautiful. Um, all right, um, I'm gonna start reading. I have a few poems. I wanna say that um, I have a few poems that are in Spanish and English. So I would read both versions. A lot of my writing practice includes both languages. Um, and a lot of, I will precede the reading by saying that a lot of my writing deals with colonization in Puerto Rico, my homeland, um, uh, and sort of oppression there. So you'll hear a lot of that. Um, Okay, this first poem is part of a series uh, with the same title. The title is Colonization Will Never End. Um, and this poem has an epigraph from Asiya Wadud that says, who do we kill without touching them? I move from the bench to the swing. Virtual therapy session just ended. I need some movement. I reopen Patricia Williams' The Alchemy of Race and Rights. I don't read more than one page. I look up. The neighborhood park is flooded after yesterday's downpour. The desert sun is out with the shade of a perfectly thick green canopy and a cool spring breeze protect me. How does generational trauma affect you? Seven adults play volleyball. Three others move back and forth in the skate park. A middle-aged white man reads on a pavilion. A few other men dressed in neon vest have a conversation with furrowed brows. I'm not sure what is happening behind me. The birds sing, a baby cries, then laughs. All this time, I swing back and forth into smaller than longer parabolas. Give me a specific example. The rusted metal of the swing makes the loud cacophonous sound matching my dance. It is not until now that I realize it is a shrieking cackle. One I'm getting concerned stares for. One I needed to hear among all this, a familiar tune. To cut suburban beauty with a horrendously gorgeous nail. I swing faster, closer and closer to the perfectly thick white clouds. The choir grows, inflamed in their tender, coarse laments. I can hear each one of them in this song, clear as the perfectly blue sky, crying, singing, moaning, heaving, dying. Can you? Ooh, that's a really fresh poem. Um, so reading it out loud is uh, quite a feeling right now. Um, okay, next poem. I'll read the Spanish first and then the English. Es la rutina. Es la rutina medir cuánto echar en las botellitas de tres onzas, de estrellas, de mar, de avería, volar, con porquerías, sin deslumbre, cada mañana contar cuánto queda, deseo turbio, 
encontronazo con la soberanía, pulir, mentir, seguir de frente, maldita en la deriva, atabé en el sueño, pez en su boca, mío, el placer de comer en escapaditas, voraz, la mordida, su sal y sollozo. ¿Por qué rías? ¿Para qué rías? Río, río, y me convierto en río. It is routine. It is routine to measure how much in the three ounce bottles of stars, of sea, of break down, to fly with porquerias without vacation glow. Every morning, count how much is left. Murky desire, encontronazo with sovereignty, polishing, lying, moving forward, damned on the halda's edge, atabe in the dream, fish in her mouth, mine the pleasure of eating on short escapades, voracious bite, its salt and sob. Por que rías, why, what, laugh, so you laugh, rio, why, what, laugh, rio, and I turn into a river. So in these two poems, um, uh, rio, it's a word in Spanish that can mean to laugh and river. Um, so I was investigating sort of that connection between the words um, and yeah, traveling back and forth, right, between Puerto Rico and the United States. Um, this next poem, also river, um, and this is after spending some time in a river in Hayuya, in the mountains in Puerto Rico, called the Rio Saliente. And there is a Spanish and English as well. I'll read the Spanish first. Río Saliente. El agua me reclama los años ciegos. Feliz con migajas de la mesa de los puercos. Yo quiero que me lleve tu corriente hasta donde las migajas se pudren y florecen. Todavía a veces se me oscurece este navegar endémico y las rocas muerden mis costillas, y los peces arañan mis dedos, y entonces entiendo que mis ojos no crean cercanía, que tocar es lo que me comunica conmigo, con los míos. Agua, tu transparencia me obliga a acariciar lo que escondo, llegamos hasta la corrosible piedad de mis pies, y con ternura me llevas a la boca de mi fracaso, donde las migajas se acumulan en una montaña gimiente que roza mi paladar. Y si pudiera pedir un deseo, sería que a la altitud se diera raíz un poco más rápido. Río Saliente. Your water demands I answer for the nothing years happy with the crumbs from the table of the pigs. I want your current to take me to where the crumbs rot and bloom. Sometimes I am still and darkened in this endemic navigation and the rocks bite my ribs and the fish scratch my fingers and the plants grip my ears. And it is then I understand my eyes do not build nearness, connection. Touch is what communicates with myself, with my beloveds. Water, your transparency forces me to caress what I hide. We reach the corrodible piety of my feet and with tenderness, you take me to the mouth of my failure where the crumbs accumulate into a moaning mountain gracing my palate. And if I could make one wish, it would be that this altitude relinquish to root a little bit faster. 
and next uh also english and spanish but this is very short it's sort of the second part of this poem and the spanish is a tanka and the english is a haiku Pío saliente te quiero enseñar mi primer capullo pero la lluvia debe erosionarme un poco más Rio Saliente, I want to show you my first bloom, but the rain must weather me some more. Okay, okay, last one. Um, okay, a little bit of a change of tone and pace. Um, this one is only in English. And uh, it's titled Origin Story, and it has an epigraph from Fran Franz Fanon, The Wretched of the Earth. Because it is a systematic negation of the other person and a furious determination to deny the other person all attributes of humanity, colonialism forces the people it dominates to ask themselves the question constantly, in reality, who am I? Origin story after Don Mite and Jenny Shia. I am who, I am reality. I am in who, I am I, I am whom reality, I am in. I cannot, my furious determination, I cannot question constantly, I cannot attributes of humanity, I cannot systemic, systematic negation, I cannot, it dominates, I cannot, the other person. My mother said, please stay here. And I said, I cannot. My friend said, please stay here. And I said, I cannot. My grandmother said, please stay here. And I said, I cannot. My grandfather said, I cannot. And I repeated, I cannot. Negation lives in the house of privilege. Who do I think I am to be here? To exclude is to exert power. I am who in reality cannot. My constant questions. What is the color of my mother's first home? How did my friend live through her grandfather's death? Why does my father pray with a furrowed brow? When will my grandmother be ready to leave her house? Where did my grandfather read the poem that changed his life, the determined my life? To force my way through a lexicon, what I need is a knife with splinters. That I want to hurt you, I don't want to deny it. My furious determination contains all attributes of humanity. It is not slippery. It is not sloppy. It is not polemic. It is polyrhythmic. To dominate as in flutter backwards into other, into person, without asking. Because stay here is a prayer I needed to furrow my brows for because I will not say please. I am reality. I am who you cannot deny. Return a sin, demolish. Systematic cannot, constant canon. I am all, broken chair, midair. I am all in. I am I, storm, laughing as it scrumptiously chews your gated vacation homes. I am who is real, themselves ready to leave the house. Death reading this, changing its mind. How delightful to not live in a question, to say it, villainy, look in the mirror, villainy, write it with red lipstick, villain. Thank you. Amazing.
Thank you so much, Nicole. And thank you, Jackie. Um, both of these readings were just absolutely gorgeous. Um, I want to definitely open this up now for questions. If folks listening have questions, feel free to unmute yourselves and just shout it out. Um, and we can take it from there. And also, if poets, if you have questions for each other, feel free. I think that I have a question that I might kick us off with, if that's all right. Yes. Um, it occurred to me, I don't think it really set in until, Nicole, you, you mentioned kind of the use of the river in, in your work, but thinking back to Jackie's reading too, um, the the wet dawn and um, this, like, there's, I, there's a couple lines that talk about a stream, Jackie, I believe it was in your second poem, and then I was thinking about Nicole, of course, your work and how both of your, all of your work, uh, both of your works, I should say, deal with that idea of the water, um, the rains, wetness, maybe in general. Um, but for whatever may come to mind, I wanted to pose an open question, maybe first to, to Jackie and then to Nicole for you both to respond to the role of water as a place or as an entity, as something to draw inspiration from. Um, or what about the water or what, what, it, what water evokes in you and, and your, your writings? Okay, um, thanks Aslan for that question. Um, I think, yeah, when I was reading where I said, um, you know, that if you, the first line of that particular poem that you referenced, you know, um, I think it, it's uh, it, the place, um, it's not like everything, you know, it, it's actually a sort of like an event, you know, that happened. And then I was there with someone who meant something to me at that time, you know, where that whole poem is set in place. And then as relationships go, you know, it didn't, of course, pan out well. But so when I was writing, um, it just, you know, so that place is, it's a, it's a tropical resort, you know, in southeastern Nigeria. And if you know Nigeria very well, uh, the area is um, an access point for coastal plains, virgin rainforests, coastal mangrove plants. And then of course the place where Nigeria is, you know, where we're more popular for the well, rich Niger Delta area, which is, you know, very much popular, um, polluted and all that. So, yeah, it was actually something that happened, you know. Um, it's just the whole thing. And then, of course, going back there through memories and all of that, it's just a, a sort of like transformation for me, you know, like a healing process for me with water, with, you know, first of all, the wet dawn after the storms and all of that. Here in Nigeria, we have just basically two seasons, the dry season and the rainy season, how it usually is in the tropical areas, you know. So, but then it rains and the whole place gets sort of like flooded, you know, and then what, um, the leaves, everything just gets clogged up and all of that. And then, but after the rains and everything happens, um, it just clears up and it just becomes really beautiful, serene, you know, um, water, water body. So I think it was just that analogy of, you know, how water can be both, you know, a destructive force and healing as well, you understand? And how, you know, after the storm and everything, and then it becomes so calm, and then you're like, okay, I thought it was going to kill me, you know, but here we are, it just seems like everything just get, got washed away, renewed in a way. Then you be, so I, it was like, the question was just, although the poem took me a little while to write, you know, like it, it wasn't just one of those just comes and it took me about six months, I think, to write this poem, you know. But so in that period, I went through all of the processes, you know, I cried in the middle of it, you know, everything happened. But, yeah, I think for me, you know, I, I'm majorly um, a nature and place poet. You know, I write basically 
my analogies, my imagery, just all nature. It's not like I planned it though. <laughs> it just happens or happens, you know. So that the whole thing with water being both a destructive force and a healing force is what I wanted to, you know, um, image in that poem. So yeah, water for me, and I come from that area as well. You know, I come from a place of thick forests and then rivers and all of that. So that that that's it for me. Water is what a healing force, you know, a destructive force. But then, what is you know, when we say destruction in nature, is nature is not destructive. Nature is what it is. You know, it happens as it should happen. So yeah, um, I, I noticed too that Nicole and I basically had almost the same themes running, you know, but for me, that was just it. It, it. Sometimes you go through something and it looks like, you know, this is the end of it. And then after some time, everything settles and you look back and you're like, okay, I grew through this process. You know? So that's what water does, I think. You know? So, yeah. uh, what a lovely answer. Um, uh, and um, I'm thinking of the similarities in, uh, in our work and the ways that we come to it too. Um, like the water, <laughs> um, for me, growing up in Puerto Rico, right? It's an archipelago and we're surrounded by ocean and we have a lot of rivers and streams. Um, and I grew up in a beach town. So the ocean was a constant uh, companion, um, a friend really. And, but uh, you know, the ocean uh, is not the most placid water as well. Um, so um, I read a lot about the river when I, um, want to investigate something that's um, less um, assertive or intense. Um, um, yeah, and then, you know, also like a subtropical place, Puerto Rico, and there's a lot of rain. Um, we have hurricanes, right? Um, we also have a wet season, a dry season. Um, but even, you know, with climate change, there's less and less of a dry season um, and storms are getting stronger too. So yeah, the water is like an ever present, uh, it's like a constant in my work because it was a constant in my upbringing. Um, and in the ways that I think about water, sort of having the ocean as your border, um, and for your country, it sort of made me think differently a little bit about what water represents um, and what it encompasses, um, and then rivers as well. Um, the, the poem about Rio Saliente, it was a recent trip uh, to Puerto Rico in the winter, um, and I just sat with the river for a while um, and just took notes of um, how I was feeling. The river just sort of speaking to me and I speaking to the river as well. Um, so yeah, I think of water as sort of its own entity um, that I can communicate with um, and it's something that I can write with in the poems to showcase, sort of write my internal <clears throat> place at that time. Thank you for that. Do we have any other questions from folks listening? I know I have some things I always am curious about and you all have both sort of mentioned your influences or things that are inspiring you, but if you would each wanna talk a little bit more about maybe things that are inspiring you right now, things that you've, you're reading lately um, that's making you excited, I would love to know. Um, yeah, what, what's sort of in your ecosystem of, of reading? <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, well, <laughs> I am a very chaotic reader, I think. You know, I might just be reading 
six to seven books <laughs> at once, you know, I'm not, I'm not, uh, but I'm trying to, I've been trying since last year, I've been trying to like get some kind of discipline, you know, like if I started a book, I just want to see if I could finish it, you know, like in a couple of days or something. I'm not really, well, I have read like a few books at once, you know, in a sitting or, but I don't have the time because I have a child, you know, and then of course there's the hustle for money, work and all of that. And then trying to write because I also just started writing during, just before the pandemic. So it's, it's just a life I'm trying to grow into and trying to, you know, um, like fit into my routine or let my routine fit into it. Let me say it that way, you know, so I really don't have the time of thought. But um, I recently, yesterday, I think I just finished reading, um, there's a book by Wislawa Zimbowska. I hope I pronounced that well, because I'm not too sure if I, I, I have it, you know. Um, I just finished reading a book, Deal with a Grain of Sand. And oh my God, I love that book. <laughs> and I was telling a friend of mine, you know, like I have quoted lines from, I mean, like, you know how you see stuff online, you come to Twitter, somebody shares a poem, you know, and I quoted, you know, a line, there's a line I love from that book, which says, forgive me distant flowers for, for I me, mean, forgive me distant walls for bringing home flowers. When I read that line, you know, it was like, you know how you feel like life is going on for you. It's for everybody, but then there are people, you know, stuff is happening elsewhere. And then you have your little pleasures, you have your flowers, you have, you know, your so I'm smiling at you. You have this little everyday moment that other people are not experiencing. So that line really caught me up. So when I read that book and I saw that that poem was actually in the book, so I really love that book. Then I'm also reading um, A Mouth Full of Blood by um, Toni Morrison. I just started it, that, uh, I think, recently as well. And then, of course, I'm reading all kinds of Everybody has like all these uh, magazines, you know, um, new poems everywhere, trying to catch up with my friends as well, you know, what they have recently published and all of that. So yeah, I, I'm just really all over the place. I don't, I usually don't have like one book I'm reading at a time. I just read everything. And sometimes I start something and then I want to do a research on something else and then something else catches my attention with that, and, you know, so yeah. I, um, I'm just trying to read, really, I know, I'm trying to learn poetry. I'm, try, I'm trying to, you know, um, get myself acquainted with the writing and all that, so yeah. Um, reading, um, I'm also a chaotic reader, um, especially being in grad school and having a gajillion things to do and trying to find the squeeze in like reading for pleasure when you can um and I also like to mix in poetry and prose um so right now um I'm reading uh I have them here because I always forget the names um uh, Ask the Brindled by No Revilla. Uh, really recommend a uh, Hawaiian, native Hawaiian writer. Um, and I'm reading um, The Wonderful Concentrate by Courtney Faye Taylor. Uh, highly, highly, highly recommend. Wonderful, wonderful book. Um, and those are poetry. And then I'm reading a book of translated short stories. So these are, this is called Baboon by Naja Marie 8. Um, I'm not gonna drop these in the chat later. Um, uh, yeah, so short stories, it feels like some of them are like four pages long. I'm like, I can do this. I can just squeeze this in, you know? Um, and they're like a different kind of pace. It sort of feels like it rewires my brain sometimes from all the poetry, uh, makes me think differently as a writer to read prose, especially translated literature. Um, I really love, love squeezing that in. 
so those are like some books that like the last two months have been like you know swirling around um and then I'm always trying to find things to read on Twitter just poets that I follow I always just there's always these little gems it's just I just yeah I love that following writers that you love and then they post things that they love and um you just find great things to read um and like I also uh, sort of like a little ritual I have in the mornings while I'm preparing breakfast I just listen to the slowdown um so a poetry podcast uh, from the poetry foundation and it's just one poem but you know they uh Major Jackson does this very beautiful introduction before that was Ada Limon and um, yeah, it just feels like a really good way to start the day. Um, so I do that as well. Um, but yeah, I feel like I could never just do one book. There's like this ecosystem of reading that I want to live in, um, of all these things swirling around. Yeah. Aslan dropped the link to the slowdown in the chat. Excellent. Um, yes, I'm like scribbling away over here all your all's recommendations because um, that all sounds amazing. We also have a question in the chat. Um, Jimin asked, um, I was wondering what your relationship with American poetry within the context of your own poetics are as antagonist and as something to live with. By American, I'm assuming Jimin, you mean like North American or US, but feel free to clarify the question if I did not ask it clearly. <laughs> okay, so I think for me, really, I don't know because I don't really, um, I don't know, I don't approach, you know, my poetry in that sense of this school, that school, this place, that place, um, all of that. Maybe because, like I said, <laughs> I'm just taking this up, you know. And so I really, um, I think actually I came into poetry through social media. I'm one of those um, Twitter poet, poets, you understand? Like uh, um, I encountered poetry through Twitter and then, you know, um, Instagram when I used to still be on Instagram. So I'm not really, I didn't really come into it like, oh, there's a school here, there's this, that, or that. I just started reading people that I love. I saw, I encountered stuff and then I read it and I loved it and all that. But I'd always, um, I always like, uh, I used to journal a lot growing up, you know, and then I loved books and then I read, but not really poetry. I used to just read stuff generally and all that. So what happened was I have this, my, my elder brother is a, is a journalist. So someday he just said, oh, I see this stuff that you do, the short notes that you make and all that. Here, 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 this is, you know, this um, place, send your work here and send your work here. So that was how I came into poetry. So I don't know how to approach it from the sense of, oh, there's a school here, there's a school there or whatever. So I just read stuff that, I like as I go along, you know. I don't say, oh, this person is from North America, American this or that. The only thing that I do is that um, I approach it from the sense of, okay, I, um, sometimes I say, oh, I wanna read nature, you know, like uh, I'm looking for poets that do nature poetry because that's what I'm doing currently and all that. So I go ahead and read their work. I, I borrow from, you know, different places, but truly there are times I can't, there's some poets, uh, maybe I try to read it and I just can't enter their work. I just can't relate to it. So I don't, I don't try to force myself, you know, to do that. Sometimes I leave the book or leave the poets, you know, then maybe someday something just rings in my head or oh, then I go back and then it's like, oh, it makes sense now all of a sudden, you understand? Then like, uh, uh, but truly, right now, I'm really loving the Eastern European poem, uh, poets. So I think uh, someone recommended um, first, I think was uh, uh, Transtroma to me, you know, um, Thomas Transtroma. That was, you know, so and then I read it and it was like, 
oh my God, I love this guy. So I read everything I could find. Then I, I went into um, Joseph Brodsky. Then I started reading Anna Kamatova. So that's like for the past few months, I've just been reading like, you know, European, East Indian poet. But I think I've read even more American poets since I started writing because that's really where through um, social media, that's where, you know, uh, um, I started with. But truly for me, because I don't have a degree in, you know, I, I just have a BSc in international relations. So I don't have like a master's or anything. So I didn't approach the work from a place of, oh, I wanted to be a poet growing up. You understand? Um, <laughs> I'm 40 this year. I started writing like three to four years ago. So I'm coming from, I usually like to call myself a lay poet. I'm just coming from a place of, this just happened, you know, I don't know what happened. Someday I just woke up and started writing poetry. So that's what happened. So I just, I approach it from there. I don't, I don't have a syllabus. I don't have you know, something I have, to, I just read as I go along. I love poetry, I come into it, but I do read because I know that to be a good poet, you know, to be a good writer, you have to, you know, read. So I take every opportunity I can to read and then to attend um, stuff like this, Zoom, you know, and then trainings, if I can help it. Last year, I think two years ago, I got like um, um, a, a bursary from the Poetry Society in, in the UK, you know, and I went through a series of trainings and all that. So that, that's for me, that's just how I approach my work. I approach it from a place of really like craft as an, like if you were going to someone's workshop to study under someone, you understand, like, I, I, and I do my writing basically by hand as well. I, I do notes and notes and notes. So if I'm writing one poem, I could go through six notebooks. That's how bad or how I have to do it, you know. And I write one line uh, up to like 10, 10 pages, you know, try, trying to just get that line right. So for me, that's the approach. I, I've never really studied under anybody or said there's a syllabus or something, you know. I just love it and I just do it. Uh, how wonderful, uh, lo lots to think about there, just sort of like the root of poetry, like why do you really do it? And like, why do you come to it? Um, so lovely to think about that. Um, can I ask for the question to be repeated again? I feel like I lost a little bit of what the question was. I'm not sure if Jimin can unmute. Um, it might be a settings issue, but the question as it is written mm -hmm. is, I was wondering what your relationship with American poetry within the context of your own poetics are as antagonist and as something to live with. And Jimin also clarified um, in a direct message. Oh, it's somewhere here. And I mean, in the hegemonic presence of American poetry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for that question, Jimin. Um, oof, lots to say there. <laughs> um, as like, it feels like it's a question I just grapple with constantly um, because I do have like institutional education, like academic education and creative writing for my undergrad and my MFA currently. Um, and as a Puerto Rican, growing up in the archipelago still, a lot of what we would read, it was American. Um, and um, be it in English or translated into Spanish um, and in the education system as well, since we're a US colony. Um, and yeah, I think trying to find my own poetics within the sort of hegemonical uh, canon of American poetry is something that I think I will continue to grapple with in my writing. Um, and um, there is a very uh, concerted effort I've made to uh, read uh, the work um, of writers that are working on the outskirts of that canon and creating their own canon. So people like Don Miche or 
uh, like No Revilla's book is incredible. Um, like the work of Black American poets right now, like African American poets is incredible um, in the ways that they're moving away from that canon. Um, and um, yeah, just making very specific uh, efforts to try to read and move my education in that direction. It was definitely not something that I was, uh, that I encountered in my undergraduate studies um, uh, to the point that it was such a white education to the point that I didn't write for a long time after that. I felt very discouraged um, and out of place, uh, sort of illegible. Um, and then sort of finding my way back into the writing because of sort of finding poets that were working uh, against the grain like that. And then also the ways that there's a whole new wave of Puerto Rican poets that are doing incredible work as well. And like reconnecting with the poetry scene in Puerto Rico and finding community there. Um, and in the ways that we're all writing and sort of aiming for an anti-colonial poetics um, against empire, against colonialism, um, sort of finding, finding that community has been very important for my work and sort of validating the ways that my work is moving. Um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, it's something that I will continue to grapple with, but it's definitely an antagonistic relationship. Um, and um, a little bit of that can be seen in the last poem that I read. Um, and in my work, there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of tenderness too. Um, and yeah, my work tries to sort of move through those things. Um, and definitely some of that anger is towards, yeah, towards that sort of a demonic canon that sort of excludes a lot of a lot of voices. Thanks for that. Um, it's nice to hear that some of the answers lie in community. That the poets that you know um, inspire us today are on Twitter and posting things, and that we can connect um, and find new voices that way, and and lift up other people's voices. On you know, it's really that's exciting to me. Um, we are really at the top of the hour at this point, um, but this has just been a really wonderful discussion and it's been great to hear your all's work and your thoughts. And I just wanna say again, thank you uh, for reading and for everyone that came and tuned in. Um, this has been really lovely and I wanna encourage everyone to keep supporting um, Jackie and Nicole's work. Um, follow them. <laughs> I know Jackie has a Twitter. If, if Nicole, you want to share your handle or a website or anything like that, um, definitely um, please feel free. And everyone um, definitely uh, feel free to come back to Poets in Pajamas. Uh, we have another reading on April 16th, which will be Mary Lee Wuna, Lee Wuna Christensen and Serena Brown. Uh, so come and check that out as well. And you can follow uh, Poets in Pajamas Facebook page or WordPress um, for links and details as that reading comes up. But thank you again so much for everyone um, for sharing your work and for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. And I love your cat, SJ. <laughs> Thank you. She's such a little lady in the background, just stealing focus. <laughs>